Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to be continuing with gases, which, of course, was sort of the other unit. So it's kind of weird that we're coming up with it again, but that's because we needed to understand how solubility worked before we could talk about the temperature and how it affects the solubility of gases. All right, so let's talk about a situation here. We're going to talk about temperature. Okay, so we're going to use soda pop as our example. So as we know, there is, of course, carbon dioxide in soda pop. That's what gives it its, its bubbly character, right? And as you, of course, know, over time, soda pop becomes flat, which means that the carbon dioxide leaves the solution and goes into the air. But temperature is going to affect the rate of soda pop, of the carbon dioxide escaping. How? Hmm. How will it affect things? Well, we know that temperature changes the size of the container, right? The hotter it is, the more you can dissolve in it, usually. Usually. But we also know that gases, the hotter they are, the faster they move. So now this is a balancing act. The container gets bigger, the size of the basket get larger, so I can, in theory, dissolve more things inside, but at the same time, the particles themselves will move faster. And if the particles are moving faster, why? It's a lot easier for them to escape. Remember what we talked about in the gas unit when it came to evaporation versus boiling. The more particles that have enough energy to escape, the faster something will evaporate. Hmm, so which one is stronger? Turns out, the movement of the gas particles is more important than the amount of space available in solution. So if we considered a glass of Pepsi on the counter at room temperature and one in the fridge, both of them are going to have gas bubbles escaping. But the one on the counter will lose gas faster than the one in the fridge. So this is a case where right there are multiple competing things going on. As we just discussed with saturation and supersaturation and unsaturated, you're going to have a situation where the larger the container, right, because it's warmer so it can store more, but that's at odds with the fact that the faster the particles are moving, the harder it is for the solution to hold on to them, right? And they're going to escape. And of course, carbon dioxide is a nonpolar, so it doesn't dissolve very well in water anyway. So we're going to see a decrease, and that means the solubility is going to be decreasing. So gases are sort of weird, right? In general, in general, if I'm trying to dissolve a solid in a liquid, which is like 90% of all of the solutions we're going to make, or you're pretty much ever going to make in chemistry, then you're going to end up with an increase in solubility as the temperature increases, right? So as it gets hotter, I can store more, right? Hotter, bigger basket, store more markers. Gases don't work that way. The hotter the solution gets, the faster the gas particles are moving, easier for them to evaporate. So they kind of break the pattern, but they follow the pattern that we already know from the gas unit. So at least that makes sense. The solubility of gases, as it says here, is lower when the solution is at higher temperature. There is a relationship to this, which we could show on a graph. It looks like this right here. Basically, we see that it is a downward trend, right? So as I get warmer, less particles stay inside. That's because more particles are able to escape because you have enough energy to escape the solution. This, of course, is very important for fish, as we discussed. I told you guys a story, right, about the fact that fish, my friend, they had a fish they were cleaning out their fish tank and inside the fish tank they had taken all the fish out and they put it in a bucket and then the fish suddenly had jumped out of the bucket for some reason even though they were in water it's because there was no oxygen left right so if the water temperature increases the ability of oxygen to be dissolved into the water decreases what this basically means is this is one of those downsides to global warming right we make the we make the or climate change in general, we make the water warmer, less oxygen can fit in it, which means that you don't get as many fish because there's just not as much oxygen for them to breathe. That's why colder waters tend to have more fish in them. The Grand Banks off the coast of Newfoundland, famous place, wonderful place to go fishing. 
more so in the old days than now, but still a great place to go fishing because the water is cold and cold water has more oxygen, which means you'll get more marine life. You got to be ready for the cold. Obviously we don't like it very much, but it works great for the fish. So this is where gases behave opposite to everything that I just talked about. Okay. That's the key thing. Gases are opposite because again, there are two things factoring in. The warmer something is, the bigger the container, the more the molecules spread out, right? Which means there's more space to fit more molecules because there's more space between them. But in the case of gases, they're itching to escape the solution anyway. So the more we spread out, the more space there is, the easier it is for the gas to escape, right? Because the only thing holding it in place is all those particles in the way. So if there's no nothing in the way, it's very simple to escape. Right? Linking back to the gas unit when we talked about trying to evaporate from the room, right? If there's a big group of people by the door, it's hard to get out. If there isn't a big group of people by the door because everyone is like spreading out, well, then it's a lot easier to make a straight run right out the door. Okay. What about pressure? How does pressure change the solubility of gases? Okay, well, let's think this through right temperature spreads things out and makes it so there's more space for the particles to escape pressure remember what we talked about when it came down to evaporation itself we said if there's a lot of people in front of the door you can't get out well same thing is true if we push down on the solution it's harder for the gas particles to escape they need space to escape into so let's take a look the pressure above a liquid affects the solubilities of a gas in a liquid shock when you open a pop bottle there is a sudden rush of gas from the bottle when the bottle is opened the built-up pressure is released and the solubility of the carbon dioxide is released increasing the pressure increases the solubility of a gas in the liquid because increasing the pressure forces the gas particles into contact with the liquid as the gas particles contact the liquid you get forces of attraction those van der waal forces london dispersion forces all of those things causing the gas to condense and dissolve Again, same basic idea as evaporation. If I've got a whole bunch of people in front of the door, it's hard for someone to get from inside the classroom to outside. If there's nobody in front of the door, it's really easy to get out. So that's the, the breakdown that we're looking at here, right? As I increase the pressure, more gas is trapped inside the liquid. So when you open up, yeah, here we go. As we increase the pressure, more of the red gas here gets pushed into the solution. This, of course, is what happens when you've got your pot, can of pop or your bottle, two, two liter bottle, and it's, it's sealed, right? And there's lots and lots of carbon dioxide in there. They overpressurize it. They supersaturate it by forcing tons of stuff in there. And that's why the pop bottle, of course, is rock hard when you try to crush it. The cans themselves are very, very weak, right? Like if you've got an empty can, you can crush that with your bare hands. You can tear that apart, but not when it's full. Not when it is full and it is sealed because it is too sturdy. The pressure is too much. So when you open it, you go from here to here. A bunch of the gas leaves the solution immediately. That's the sound that you hear, the psh. But here we've still got a roof on this particular example, but instead we take the roof off. And what happens? This gas particles, they just leave flat out. That's why over time, once you've cracked open the seal on a bottle of pop, a two liter bottle pop will over time go flat because no matter what you do, there's always more carbon dioxide dissolved in solution than it normally should be able to take. You, you know this because when you're drinking it, it's bubbly. You feel the bubbles on your tongue. That's part of why people like pop. If you didn't feel the bubbles and they just stayed in solution, that means that there would be, of course, the same amount of carbon dioxide dissolved in the pop as there is in, say, a glass of water, because there's carbon dioxide in water too. But we don't, you can't feel that bubble because it's dissolved. If you took normal tap water, right, and you were to decrease the pressure, carbon dioxide in the water would e start to escape. That's what we're kind of talking about here. So increasing the pressure can make it so that way the carbon dioxide, you can put more in there. And that's how they originally set up pop bottles, right? The pops, cans, whatever. Once you open it 
that's it. It can escape now. And once it starts to escape, it becomes easier and easier and easier. Now, this is where, of course, having the ability to seal up the bottle is good, but there's a kind of a catch. Because we know gases are very compressible. And when you start with a two liter bottle of pop, you've got a fairly small amount of air on the top here and a fairly large amount of liquid on the bottom. Well, the more you drink, the less gas, the less liquid there is, the more gas there is in your pop bottle. More gas can take more space. So the rate of carbon dioxide escaping increases the more you drink because the bottle stays the same size and the carbon dioxide expands to fill up that space. This is why one of those life hacks comes in where people, they suggest, why don't you take the bottle and you crush it down to make it so it takes up less space so that we have less room to fill the gas in. I don't think it'll actually work enough. The pressure differences are too crazy, but I don't know. You can give it a try, see if it works for you. So here's another example of solubility and pressure and why it's important. Not one that we're going to deal with a lot around here, uh, at least not unless you decide to take up scuba diving. We've talked about before, uh, we talked about the bends in the gases unit, and we only kind of talked about it very briefly. We talked about how pressure can have a real big impact on diving. Well, now we're going to talk about it in a little more detail, as you can see right here. The pressure and solubility of gas underwater is pretty critical because you gain one atmosphere for every 10 meters you go down, right? So at 20 meters, you're at three atmospheres of pressure, one for the normal atmosphere and then two for the 20 meters you've gone. When there's enough pressure, even nitrogen gas will dissolve in your blood. Normally, you inhale and exhale nitrogen, nothing happens, right? When you breathe in and breathe out, most of the time, you're actually breathing in a lot of nitrogen because most of the atmosphere is nitrogen, but it doesn't do anything. It's inert. It has no real effect. But if you're deep enough underwater, nitrogen will dissolve into your blood. So when you breathe in, you will get all the oxygen that you breathed in from your tank, but you'll also get any nitrogen that you breathe in. This is fine by itself. Nitrogen is still inert, so it'll pass around through your blood. It'll come back to your lungs. You're going to breathe out. <sighs> the nitrogen leaves. Doesn't care. No big deal. Okay, well, that's not bad. But if you lower the pressure too quickly, you have a problem. Right? So you go from really high pressure to really low pressure, what's going to happen? The nitrogen is no longer going to be dissolved. It will turn back into a gas. This allows the nitrogen to escape from the solution and form blood bubbles in your blood vessels. Your blood vessels, of course, are designed to hold blood, not gas. This becomes ow. These bubbles block the flow of blood. They also expand your blood vessels, which can cause rupturing, uh, aka bruises under the skin if you don't break the skin. This is known as decompression sickness or the bends. It's painful because you've got all over your entire body, certain areas have no blood getting to them, that's bad. Other areas, the gas is bursting your blood vessels and trying to escape. It's trying to like work its way out through your skin. Overall, it's a real big problem, which means that you can't very quickly rise to the surface of the water when you're deep underwater, at least not if you've got um, various, like a, a scuba tank, right? So this is a tricky thing to do. We are, of course, as discussed, designed to be able to breathe in gases at about this elevation with this much pressure, one atmosphere, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight atmospheres. We're going to have a hard time. Hmm. All right, here's an example question for you guys, right? Is this a solution? P Pepsi? Yeah, of course. What are the solutes? There are many. Uh, carbon dioxide, sugar, dye, coloring, flavoring, syrup. Take your pick. There's loads. What's the solvent? Water. What type of solution is this? It's homogeneous, right? If I leave out a can of Coke, bottle of Pepsi, whatever, I don't care, it's not really going to transform. It's not going to separate out. Not if it's sealed anyway. Are the solutes and solvents polar and nonpolar? They're obviously polar because like dissolves in like. And then that last question, why does the drink make a popping or fizzing noise when you open it? We know this. We just talked about it. Here it is. Carbonated beverages have CO2 gas dissolved in an aqueous solution. It's the fizz. 
in bottling of the beverage, the CO2 is dissolved in the solution at a pressure higher than the normal atmospheric pressure. When the cap is opened, the decrease in pressure above the solution results in a decreased solubility of CO2. Therefore, the CO2 escapes. We just talked about that. This note I want to point out because this is pretty, it's one of those things people get wrong. The solubility of solids and liquids are not affected by changes in pressure, but the solubility of a gas in a liquid is greatly affected by pressure change. So if I take, you know, sugar and I try to dissolve it in water, it doesn't matter what the outside pressure is. It has no effect, right? This is why you've got your can of Coke, bottle of Pepsi, whatever. You crack it open, it'll go flat, but it won't suddenly become not sweet, right? The sugar inside stays the same. It doesn't escape. Everything else escapes, but not the sugar. Okay? Just keep that in mind, right? We've talked about this before. Gases behave differently. That's why we had a whole separate section on the gas unit, why in physical properties of matter, we spent a bunch of time talking about evaporation versus boiling. Right, the vaporization, the turning of liquid to gas, had a whole extra set of rules to it because it was so unique. So that uniqueness for gas continues. And that's it. We're going to leave it there. Next, we're going to talk about solubility curves. This is going to be taking solubility, and we're going to be putting it into a graph form so you guys can like observe it and understand it and get numbers for it. But that'll be next time, and I'll see you guys then.